First of all, thank you very much for agreeing to have a conversation with me. And let me start sharing a personal anecdote with you. So when I was six or seven years old, my mother told me a story written by the famous Bengali poet and novelist Rabindranath Tagore. The name of the story was Kabuliwala. And the two main characters of the story are a peddler from Kabul Rahmat and a little girl Mini. Whenever Rahmat interacted with Mini, he always thought about his own daughter whom he did not meet for a long time. The story depicts the relationship between a father and his daughter in a universal way, irrespective of their country of residence. And the story ends with a sad note, but still it talks about the bright side of humanity. And most of the Bengali children actually grew up reading this famous short story. So just to let you know that I first got to know about Kabul and Afghanistan through this story. Well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's growing up with, uh, you know, having the love for Indian cinema, the culture, the food, um, you know, wonderful memories of childhood. My father had a lot of friends both in Afghanistan who were of Indian origin originally, but who had become Afghanized. And so they were Afghan citizens. Uh, so the Sikhs living in, in Afghanistan. Um, and I grew up listening to Bollywood. In fact, that's where I learned my Hindi and Urdu from. Uh, unfortunately, over the past, I would say 40 years, 45 years, the politics of uh, particularly India and Pakistan, um, have caused enough trouble to Afghans where it's becoming very, very difficult to, uh, to keep friendships, to keep that humanity alive, knowing that you know, two cultures can still love and respect each other because unfortunately, um, I don't wanna have pity on ourselves as Afghans, but there's there's a problem between India and Pakistan and Afghanistan is consistently and systematically used by both nations against the other. Um, and so in the end, uh, we're, we as Afghans have consistently suffered in this uh, without, without having a say in this fight really. Uh, but because of our economy, because of the destruction, the destructive wars that has plagued Afghanistan for you know, more than four decades now, um, this the the nation has become weakened, and so the proxy war between India and Pakistan carries itself on the grounds in Afghanistan, unfortunately. According to my little research, I got to know that you were born in Kandahar province in 1977, but after three years, you moved to Pakistan due to the Soviet invasion in 1980, and at the age of ten you immigrated to the United States of America. Could you please tell us more about your childhood days and did you face any cultural shock at that time? Um, so officially, uh, uh, yeah, I was very young when we immigrated to uh, Pakistan as refugees uh, after the communist coup. Um, and although I have snippets or mem uh, mem memory of just bits and points of that journey. Um, the fact that we were a large family, it was my father, my mother, um, five sisters, I was one of the five. Um, my grandmother, paternal grandmother, my paternal aunt, in fact, two aunts, my dad's two sisters. Um, we all accompanied each other in this journey to Pakistan. And I was recently telling um, my, my own daughter, who's almost 12, um, because she's still trying to recover from the, uh, the recent journey we've taken as refugees to um, Afghanistan or from Afghanistan to the US. And of course, as a little child, she's also going through that emotional uh, transformation of, of voicing her emotions. And as she cried and, and you know, very explicitly, 
stated that she missed her friends, she missed her home, she missed her school, she missed her life in Afghanistan. Um, I told her that I was, you know, that I had, had similar experiences to her around but two, twice before her age. One when I was little, about four or five years old, and then the second time exactly around her age, 11 and a half-ish. Um, and then she's, she was, she's, she's smart enough and she picked up, she's like, well, you had a lot of family. Uh, she's an only child. So, and in retrospect, yes, it does make a difference when you are surrounded by your loved ones, because that number of, a, of having a, a large family, it helps with just settling, um, adjusting to a new life because you, you don't feel so lonely. Where when you are in small numbers and you do have just a nuclear you know, family of three, mom, dad, and a child, um, coming to a completely new environment in a new city, things, things you know, they're different. Um, then you have to start making new friends. You have to start getting adjusted to the new environment. I mean, it, it happens with the other scenario as well. Uh, but I think for us, initially going to Pakistan, again, I was a child. I have memories of it. But I think because the societies were similar, that adjustment wasn't so difficult. Um, and where we settled in Pakistan um, as a family, the... Um, the environment, the terrain, both the physical terrain as well as weather-wise, uh, food-wise, culture-wise, religion-wise, I mean, there was a lot of similarities. So it didn't really feel that foreign to me as a child. Um, but then when we finally immigrated to the US in 1988, um, there was that culture shock uh, where the language changed, the religion identity changed, the food changed, the environment, the physical environment of how we lived, how we carried ourselves, that changed. And so there was a, there is a much bigger recognition of trying to assimilate and get adjusted to an environment like America compared to an environment um, like Pakistan that I did in my lifetime. Thank you very much for sharing your story. I don't know, probably, do you think that it helped you somehow because you got a chance to experience different culture at that time? Of and course, when I was a child experiencing it, I wasn't able to see this, right? Now as an adult, having gone through that experience once again in my life, uh, it has become a, a lot more apparent um, how societies and you know, the similarities or the dissimilarities in societies do affect the experiences of uh, refugees. Now, let us focus on your university days. You did your bachelor in religious and gender studies at the University of Virginia. Why did you decide to study this subject? Is there any special reason behind it? Um, it's an interesting question. Many people do ask me that. How? Well, first of all, there's this assumption that you cannot be religious and yet still believe in women's rights and women's emancipation. And through my uh, uh, studies and, and approach to handling or studying these two subjects together, um, I've consistently argued and will consistently argue that religion per se, uh, and of course people have their difference of opinions and that's fine and I respect that, but there's no, no at least in, in, in my faith of Islam, there is no, uh, I have never felt as a Muslim that I was uh, not allowed to or, or prevented from doing the things I wanted to do in my life because of my faith. Now, certainly we all, all of us, all human beings, choose and live by values, by uh, things that are important to us, that make a difference to us. And so we all make choices, whether they're in the framework of a religion, of a lifestyle, of a culture, of a society, you know, everybody has that choice. Um, and it's the choices that we make that then bound us to how we perform in that. And, and you know, we are always free as human beings to change and amend our choices. Um, having studied these uh, two subjects, I learned that 
the stereotypical mindset that was, you know, existed in much more strength at that time in the late 90s when I was in college, as compared to today, there's a lot more literature, a lot more narratives uh, have added to the, a lot more voice and, and discussion has been added to this discussion about uh, whether the religion Islam, uh, you know, really oppress women and mute them and immobilize them, which was unfortunately the narrative that I was reading in, in the literature that was presented to me uh, in my classes at university. And I, and I, I questioned it because I, as a Muslim woman, my parent, you know, my mother and my sisters and my friends as Muslim women, there was nothing that we practiced in our lives that said such a thing that you cannot get educated, you cannot work, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Yes, we did it in the uh, framework of what it meant to be a Muslim, you know, person living on earth, but it was not, I never sensed that my religion ever stopped me from doing what I desire to do with my life. And so um, I carried these two studies forward um, and I cannot be even, I cannot be more happy today because I think in retrospect in the late 1990s, I was preparing myself to go to Afghanistan. And there were some uh, prerequisites to have as a woman working in a society like Afghanistan. Um, and my studies and my background in understanding both the religion better, as well as um, you know, having the concepts of what women's right really entail and mean helped me in identifying the critical problems that I did in Afghanistan, working as a woman, working for women, um, and um, doing all the great things that I've done. Um, I don't regret ever making that decision uh, in college to go uh, drop out from a pre-med student, which is typical for all, for most refugee kids. When you go to places like America or Europe, um, every family desires their kids to become either doctors or engineers. Um, um, you know, the, the three idiots model. <laughs> wow. And so I was a, I was a pre-med, but I decided that that's not where my passion was. My passion was more in the humanities and the readings and the writings and the understandings of what cultures and societies and religions and communities do. And that's what I chose to do. And uh, I'm living, I've been living and breeding my education the past 20 years of my life, uh, of working life. So you came back to Afghanistan in 2003, a few months after the collapse of the first Taliban government. Um, why did you return to Afghanistan at the time, living a more safe and comfortable life in the USA? Um, when you look back, do you have any regrets for making that decision? Um, no, I, uh, I even said it before, I have absolutely no regrets. Um, and that's one uh, wonderful thing about my life is that uh, everything and anything that I've done to this day, um, it has been done with a choice that I've made. Uh, of course, considering the circumstances around me uh, as everybody does, but I don't regret uh, making the choices that I have. And that includes the choice to go back to my birth country. Um, many people asked me, and even at the time that I decided in 2003 to go back, um, in fact, there was even a desire to go back even when the Taliban were in control and uh, not to live and work there, but I wanted to go visit Afghanistan in the late 1990s uh, to, to see it firsthand uh, as to all the uh, reportage that we were getting about the Taliban treatment of the women and society and girls and education and kids. And I was young. Um, I wanted to go even then. Uh, unfortunately, circumstances did not allow for it. But when there was the opportunity uh, after 2001 or you know, late 2001, 2002, um, I finally landed in Afghanistan in 2003, uh, initially in the hopes of working to um, to do what I could for my sisters, for, for the women, for, um, I mean, at that time I was young, I wasn't really focused on children as much, um, be coming back, you know, going back with the background of women's uh, rights and women's, you know, feminist theory. Um, there was that desire to go help women because it was, it was apparent that, that they needed help. Um, and really within 
returning after about two months of being on the ground, even though I always considered myself to be a full Afghan, and I am, I'm a proud full Afghan, um, but I was very uncomfortable with calling myself an Afghan American growing up in the States. But when I went back to Afghanistan in 2003, after about two months, I realized that I really am an Afghan American and not a pure Afghan alone. Uh, because the experience and the life, the education and the upbringing in American society, as much as in the world might see it as purely still Afghan, because I kept my traditional attire, we kept eating you know, Afghan food, I kept speaking my native language of Pashto at home, and uh, you know, desire to learn the second language of Dari. So it looked more, I was more, more an Afghan in America, but when I returned to Afghanistan, my home country, my birth country, I realized that my thinking had become Americanized. And what, that, what I mean by that is this, no, this notion of analytical skills, um, you know, the, the ability to think about the future and to believe in the future and to assess and analyze the past as it relates to your present and the future. I mean, these are these are notions that unfortunately in a country like Afghanistan, uh, where the education system, you know, really has been shattered to pieces over, you know, since 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 40 years ago, 45 years ago. It was difficult to sit and have a conversation with a local Afghan, um, you know, counterpart about a potential future because it was difficult for them for them to dream of a future. Um, and now, after 20 years and witnessing the collapse and witnessing uh, the, the, the destruction of the nation and of a people, I now also understand why it's difficult for Afghans to have a futuristic, uh, you know, analytical skill instilled in their heads because unfortunately for many, you know, in their lifetime, they've seen too much of destruction and um, breaking of promises, um, you know, just, just destroying any hopes and dreams that they may have built with them themselves. And so even, even if it was practically and analytically taught through the education system, just the, 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 the practical nature of what happened in Afghanistan in the past, you know, four plus decades, um, has taught a society as a whole not to have any faith in the future. It's all about today and now because we don't know what tomorrow may bring. And so that realization was a great uh, thing for me um, as a human, as an Afghan, as a woman, uh, to understand where Afghans are coming from um, as much as I liked and thought, thought that I was an Afghan. Uh, but it really took me uh, it, it took a lot of effort to just stay there, understand. And so my initial commitment um, uh, in 2003 was to go for about a year or two maximum, do the work that I could. And, you know, the American utopian dreams that is taught to us in universities that we are capable of achieving anything we want, right? Um, be the change you want to be, I think is the uh, uh, Gandhi. quote of Gandhi, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, while that is still my motto and I still live in, and breathe by that, um, but at the same time, I quickly realized in Afghanistan, returning back, that the problems that the society of Afghanistan was dealing with was not going to be resolved in six months, a year, or two years' time. So quickly realizing that I was not going to achieve anything in a short period of two years, I committed myself to staying there, and uh, I was there until August 15th. 2021. Then you worked a few years on women's rights and women education in Afghanistan. You have talked about it and also you have written a book on it. But how did you become the education minister of Afghanistan? Did ex-president Ashraf Ghani called you and asked you to join the education ministry and help him to rebuild the, um, rebuild the education system of Afghanistan? Um, it's a little 
long of a journey. I hope I don't go. <laughs> you can cut me in the middle. No, please, um, please. So like I said, when I first went, I was totally focused and on helping women um, because that's the mission that I went with. Um, after working with various women's groups and uh, you know pushing the women's agenda, providing economic opportunity uh, opportunities for women to earn incomes, um, for, you know, participating and pushing for women to get, you know, short-term quick trainings on learning new skills, new, having, gaining new tools to advocate for themselves and their rights, uh, both nationally and internationally. Um, and, and I was successful, um, I, and that work still continues. I quickly, I mean, not quickly, but after about five years, I realized, I said, um, how much longer are we going to push adults, women, adults, uh, to do something that should have been ingrained, you know, within them from childhood. And who and what systems do that? Um, it's obviously education. So about five or six years after being in Afghanistan, um, I started thinking that the long term strategy for addressing these critical issues that prevent prevent women from, um, you know, attaining and practicing and enjoying the rights that are that are their rights, it really must begin at the foundation, which is at their young age and the school structures. Um, and if we educate, uh, you know, women from that beginning, those developing years to say that you're just as worth um, as your brother, as your male cousin, or as your male, um, you know, um, classmate, that in itself will hopefully help uh, raise women to believe in themselves and do things from a foundation. Um, and so there was a dream always to start a girl's school. Um, I even started thinking and dreaming about potentially starting a girl's school in Kandahar. Um, and then I said, no, not just girls' schools, boys and girls' schools <laughs> together too. And I, you know, in my, in my dream, I had this idea of um, potentially getting 100 girls, 100 boys, you know, investing 12 years of my life and committing 12 years to, you know, starting them from grade one to grade 12, graduating them, and then at least in my, you know, in my small head of, of dreams, I was thinking of, I would be contributing 200, 100 men, 100 women, uh, young adults who would have had a different educational experience uh, and hopefully push up many of them to go and seek higher education. But at least the goal at that time was a solid 12th grade education with values instilled. Um, and of course, it was a dream and life got busy. I got pregnant. I gave birth to a beautiful young daughter and um, kept thinking about it. And before I knew it, seven years had passed and it was time for my daughter to go to school. I looked around for opportunities for her to um, be enrolled in school in, in Kandahar. I enrolled her in public schools. I, I didn't like it. Then took her to several private schools. Didn't like it because it was just... It was pressure, it was um, doing things to her that I did not think were right for a child her age. Um, and I'll simply uh, simplify it by, you know, she was six years old when I enrolled her. Uh, there's no kindergarten in the Afghanistan education system. So they immediately put her in first grade. So being in first grade, she would get 10 pages of homework a night. You don't do that to a six year old child. Um, and the stress that I saw with her, you know, she was constantly crying because she just could not finish 10 pages of repetition writings over and over again, which honestly, now that I know how, you know, kids learn, it absolutely makes no sense why we force children to repeat, you know, 10 pages of writing a letter of the alphabet. Um, but that's what the teachers were doing. And so I got anxious about her future and I started questioning what good was I doing to myself and to society if I was jeopardizing the future of my own daughter. Uh, so that, that questioning forced me to leave Kandahar um, and go to Kabul uh, where at least there was a better opportunity for her. Um, my good friend and a, a educational specialist had a, a dream of starting a 
a school, an international school with international standards and systems in place, uh, but of course with Afghan values and Islamic foundation um, for, for people like myself who, who wanted a different future for their children, but not necessarily want to leave the country. So with his brainchild um, of starting the school, I basically jumped on the opportunity and started working with him. And we started um, uh, the first registered international school in Kabul by the name of Mizan International School. And my daughter was the first child or the first student in the school. And uh, before we knew it, our numbers increased and we found, like we expected, there were many parents who wanted quality education with international standards for their children in Afghanistan. And so I uh, very rapidly and successfully um, attracted many students and families and our children's performance became obvious um, to the point where uh, I believe one of our closing, um, if, I mean, we weren't graduating students yet because we started from grade one, but at the end of every year, we did a celebratory, you know, program for parents to, to teach what they're, to, to show them and to kind of show up what we were doing with our children and what they were learning. So dramas and skits and performances, and it was, it was nice. And I believe uh, results of one of these performance um, reached the president, um, uh, and uh, COVID started March, or we we were forced to, as a nation, to shut down schools uh, due to COVID in 2020. Um, and with our school, because we were dealing with the elites really in the country, elites in the sense that they had the monetary means to pay for internet for the children, um, unlike the majority of the nation. But because we were a private school, um, within by by April, uh, the school shut down in March. By mid-April, we were able as a school to set up the infrastructure of going online to virtual classrooms. Um, and we had a wonderful service provider of internet who helped uh, tremendously in installing better uh, quality internet to the homes of parents who were willing to participate in this. And so our studies actually went virtual very quickly uh, in a country like Afghanistan that nobody would have imagined. And uh, as we started these studies, um, one day I received a call um, from the president's secretary, introduced himself as the president's secretary and said the um, honorable president Ashraf Ghani is interested in speaking to you um, about Mizan International School. And I, I kind of in my head speculated that it's probably you know, the, the, the fact that we went virtual and that we're providing an alternative form of education service to the children. And I, I, I kind of knew that that's what he wanted to explore. So I set the appointment. Um, next day, we talked for close to an hour, uh, going over how we started the school. You know, he was, it, it's, it, he was interviewing me without my knowledge, just to understand how much I knew about education the policy behind what we were doing, the vision we had created for the school, the training we provided our teachers, how did we prepare them to teach an international curriculum in a language that was foreign to them. It was English, it was not Pashto or Dari. And how we were integrating back our own uh, mother's tongue, uh, Pashto or Dari into the curriculum and keeping the values and the religion intact. And at the end of the conversation or the interview, he basically offered me um, his proposal. He said, I have a proposal for you. And as he said, I have a proposal for you in my head, I said, oh, he wants Mizan to become the model school. Um, and I'm sure that he's gonna want to have Mizan be, you know, work in partnership with the Ministry of Education to expand this online learning platform. And um, he proposed to join his cabinet. Uh, totally shocked, totally surprised. I remember even screaming saying, I can't believe or something to that nature. And he laughed um, and he said, I know you didn't expect this, um, but let's meet in person and talk um, because I've been following your work and um, I believe that you could be a, um, an instrument in changing how we provide education to Afghanistan's kids. And then it took uh, about a little over a week, I think almost eight days, seven days uh, for me to think about it, 
have several more in-depth conversations with him in person, face to face, um, because I, I was not a politician. And that I think is the probably the most interesting thing for me as a person is how do people like myself accept such, such positions which are completely political? Um, and I and and I want your listeners to to understand and and part of the reasons why I talk about this is for people to understand what is politics and perhaps we all need to redefine or give a new definition to politics. Um, you know, so I used to bluntly tell people when I first joined, "Oh, I'm not a politician." But at the end, towards the end of my time, exactly 14 months uh, on August 4, August 15th. Um, I became comfortable with saying, this is my politics, providing service, providing a technical vision and, and having a technical vision and, and a vision of change and a vision for doing things differently than how politicians normally do. Perhaps that is another definition of politics because politics don't have to be, in, particularly in that part of the world, politics don't have to be the dirty politics that most of our societies are used to. It could potentially be a true, honest service filled with integrity and honor um, to do things better. And that could be politics. And so um, today, even though, yes, I lost my country, I lost my government, I lost all the millions of children that I was so proudly serving. Um, in fact, in a very short period of time, I did receive the title of mother of education, which is an honorable thing for me and for any woman. Uh, but I truly did start seeing the children and I still continue to see, I have not stopped caring about or thinking about the children of Afghanistan as my own. Because if I wanted, and if I want a future, a better future for Zara, Perhaps my politics or my, my, my politics as Minister of Education of Afghanistan in the time that I was, my, my politics was also to see a different and to give a different future to the millions of children of Afghanistan. Because if I want it for Zara, I certainly should want it for all the other kids too. And so in that regards, um, I gave it my best. It was not very well received in a very political environment. Um, but I have absolutely no regrets doing all the, um, you know, few things that I did that, that I was able to in a short time. Uh, but I'm proud of even the little that I did. I, I did it with all my full heart, um, with honor and with integrity. And I don't regret anything um, of the past 18 years or 19 years that I served in Afghanistan. That's great. And could you please share with us your achievements being the education minister of Afghanistan. And what are the things that you wanted to do, but you could not do it due to the fall of Kabul? Um, there was a very uh, straightforward reform agenda. You know, and many ministers come, uh, I've studied uh, this of politicians, many people come and then they create um, a change agenda or a reform agenda, and then some succeed in implementing it and some don't. And our reform agenda um, looked at the education system of Afghanistan through the lens of education alone. Uh, my reform agenda did not uh, take into consideration the political uh, scenario um, of the country. Um, unfortunately, what I discovered uh, in my short time, particularly the first six months um, that I spent learning about the ministry, learning about the procedures in the ministry, the structure of the ministry, uh, the policies that the ministry had completed or, or, or uh, written up in the past 20, 18 years prior to my coming. Um, People were impatient with me. They said, oh, she's not capable of understanding, but somebody who was coming new to this, um, to this you know, field, uh, I knew education, but I certainly did not know how the Ministry of Education was running. Um, I learned that there, was a lot of, there were a lot of flaws. So I did my assessment the first six months. Um, 
And the flaws that I discovered was that first and foremost, the structure of the ministry was made over the past 18 years, since 2001, really, because we the ministry started from scratch. Yes, the, the Ministry of Education existed you know, for more than 100 years in Afghanistan, but in the past 18 years, since 2001, prior to my coming, the, the structure of the ministry had expanded and had become really big. We had close to 6,000 personnel only working at the ministry in Kabul alone. And what I had to understand was what were these 6,000 people doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Because it's a lot of people, it's a, lot, it's a huge investment. And um, I mean, at the end of the day, yes, the Ministry of Education was predominantly responsible for the education of all kids who wanted to get educated free of charge because it's our constitution. We provide free education to all kids who want it uh, in 34 provinces, boys and girls from grade one to 12. That's pretty much, an, in a nutshell, what the responsibility of this uh, ministry was. And of course, all the policies, all the procedures, and all the, the, teach, the management of the teachers that were teaching all these kids, uh, of course, was also the mandate of the ministry. But why you needed 6,000 people to manage that uh, was a question that I asked initially, and I started assessing. And what I quickly found out was that the structure of the ministry had been changed and amended and created to please a variety of groups, politicians, um, ethnic groups. Um, what I discovered was that the Ministry of Education had put in place uh, staff uh, from advisory role to technical specialists to deputy ministers, uh, not, necessary, not necessarily in light of enhancing the service to the children across 34 provinces, but more so to please a variety of ethnic groups, a variety of political parties and leaders, and please them by appointing their people to a position. Uh, I'll begin with the prime example of the day I went, there were 17, one seven um, advisors appointed to the minister's seat. Um, and so while this was both a good thing saying, wow, 17 people advising you on technical issues at the ministry, after doing a thorough assessment of these 17 people, not a single one, not a single one of these 17 people had a background in education education philosophy, education, um, you know, theory, edu practical education. Um, there were a few who are writers and that's fine. I mean, writers are great things, but why are writers advising the Ministry of Education? There were uh, old time teachers who had taught for many years and then retired. And so fine, I can understand their uh, involvement as well. But there was a bunch of illiterate, uh, fake um, holders of MBAs or master degrees, um, you know, in things like HR. Why the Ministry of Education needs an HR advisor when it has a whole directorate dedicated of over 500 people in the HR directorate? Why do you need an advisor for that? It, it, you know, that that, that was kind of one of the, the issues that I personally found. Um, so I, I did, after doing a thorough assessment of these 17 individuals and seeing their contribution to the Ministry of Education, and when I figured and my assessment taught me that they really were not contributing to making the service of education to the children of Afghanistan any better, um, I had to let them go. Um, a lot of money was being invested in them. I would rather put that investment in more of the, you know, the, the, the structures that benefited the system, schools, uh, teachers, and, and whatnot. Um, so similar to that, I found across the ministry parallel structures there were five deputies, deputy ships under the minister. There were six initially, one had left before I, uh, or they had separated one before I came. 
And so I found parallel structure, uh, structures within the five deputies. And so in a sense, there were, um, I summarized the structure of the ministry as there is a minister or there was a minister with one directorate called the planning directorate that also served as the minister's office because he or th that department was pretty much making all the decisions with donors and, and setting vision and, and, and mission for the ministry. And then you had the five deputies who were also kind of parallel, parallelly running the ministry according to their own rules and regulations. There was no cohesion to understand one vision. And so the reform agenda immediately said, if we're going to become an effective ministry, we need to relook and redesign the structure to be, uh, to be effective and to serve what the ministry's mandate is, is to make education better. But what I quickly realized is that when I proposed that change, that change was um, very quickly met with political resistance from all the variety of groups that were involved in Afghanistan, because it meant that the posts that were given unnecessarily to all these various people were going to get lost. So I was proposing to cut down the Ministry of Education's personnel from close to 6,000 down to about 2,700-ish, and then do another layer um, the following year, because even 2,700 was a lot of people. Um, so we started with that. We started with the top. Um, we changed uh, the deputies. We changed uh, uh, the directorates. We brought the directorate, uh, the directorates down totally from over 110 directorates across the ministry uh, to about 22, I believe. Um, and this is after the restructuring. Um, so we were able to accomplish that. Uh, but of course, the lower down, the lower people were just, we were just about to reshift and we were not going to let anybody go without a job. We were going to reshift all of these people to go back to schools, to the actual, areas where they were needed. Our schools were understaffed. We didn't have enough teachers. We didn't have enough administrators, but everybody was happy working at the ministry. And my, my proposal was, you're not gonna lose a job. You're just going to be reshifted from the ministry to a school that needs you. And so we were about to do that, unfortunately, when things uh, collapsed. Uh, in addition to the restructuring, which was a major component of the accomplishment that I'm uh, proud of making, was uh, for the first time in the history of, or at least the past 20 years of history, and I, I believe even in the history of Afghanistan's education system, we drafted and finalized a, um, for the first time, a national education policy for the year for 1400 that we had finalized and we were on the brink of publishing it. Um, we also worked on just um, con exploring alternative ways to include and to provide ways for children to graduate, particularly girls in areas where it was the access to education was still a very hard thing to do. Either there were not schools in the close vicinity built for them in the past 20 years, or the, the conservative areas that didn't feel comfortable allowing girls to go to a, you know, physically out to school. We were actually exploring ways of how could we make a take advantage of this fourth industrial revolution uh, in front of us, the, you know, the internet, the, the, the technological world. And instead of asking girls to come out of their homes in areas where they could not, but take education instead to them, to their laptops and to their phones and uh, via technology and still enable them to complete their education. So these are some of the major changes and how we wanted to see education. And then at the end of it all, I think, um, not I think, the most important thing was that we started looking at education through an ecosystem lens where we approached, you know, the very controversial thing that came out about proposing mosques to be used as ed educational places. Um, Criticism came against me saying at that time that I was a Talib because I wanted kids to go to masjids or, you know, mosques to study. 
Whereas my thinking was there are areas in Afghanistan where within 150 kilometers, there's no school to be seen. So instead of keeping those children in the dark, there's a mosque almost every other, every two kilometers, maybe even less in, in all across Afghanistan. So if there's a space with the roof and a, a, a classroom setting that could be used to gather kids, bring a teacher, get a book and a board to teach them, even if it's called a mosque, we are a Muslim society. There should be no problem with encouraging children to come and study, even if it means inside the mosque. And that is part of the ecosystem because as a whole, you use a masjid for prayers. What stops you from using that same space for teaching children? Because ultimately, as a Muslim citizen leader, no matter what you do is part of your Islamic way of life. And our Islam, our, our Ministry of Education's teaching mandate had was not against Islam. So there was no need to have this shift that unfortunately over the past 40 years has been created. This is from the time of the communists and it has stayed with us. So in, in, in a sense, I was proposing and I, and I did propose a lot of radical changes uh, to the way things were running in the Ministry of Education. Um, of course, a lot of people liked it, but of course, at the same time, just like with anything, with any political post, there's always going to be opponents and they're going to speak out. And unfortunately, the social media today uh, is, a, is a much bigger platform to those voices. Um, and uh, in a society where many people don't have access to like full depth, you know, full in-depth information, they start believing anything that anybody posts on social media. And of course you get blamed and, and painted as a monster when you're really not. Um, but so, yeah, that was, <laughs> I said a lot, but it's, it was, there's, there's a lot that we did in a very short time of uh, time that we had in a very politically unstable and a very violent uh, time in history of Kabul. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have accomplished the, the little that we were able to in the short time. Thanks. It certainly gives us a clear picture of your contributions to the education ministry. But to follow the ethics of journalism, I also have to ask you some controversial questions as well. So if a girl wants to sing in a public event, why the government will have a problem with it? And I'm not talking about the Taliban regime, but I'm talking particularly about your government. Because in March 2021, a few months before the fall of Kabul, your government barred girls under 12 years from singing in public events. Why a government will do so? Who knows, probably we could have Miley Cyrus, Taylor Swift, or Ariana Grande from Afghanistan who could actually glorify Afghanistan name on the world stage. This is a wonderful question. I'm glad you are asking as a journalist. And this is my, uh, not plea, but it is a request to journalists um, to really actually use even this example as a, as a study case. First of all, the government of Afghanistan never banned girls from singing. So there needs to be that clarification. And this is exactly what I meant by social media, picking up a hot topic that you know plays with people's emotions and then you know spits it out and unfortunately even some of our best journalists uh, don't take the time to dig down to study to research what is the history behind what is being shared on social media and then everybody starts believing it and so everybody starts uh, blaming people so I will take this moment to explain that this was not a mandate given by myself, uh, either endorsed by the president or any other entity within the government of Afghanistan. Do you wanna ask something? No, 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 sure. Oh, okay, okay. So the, how this all happened was, again, as a woman minister of education after almost 30 years of not having a female um, run the ministry, I witnessed a reality that started to bother me. 
And that reality was everywhere that I went, whether it was in school environment, which was a different environment, you know, you have the school, you have the kids, you have the, the environment that of adults that are dealing with the school or any other government entity program. So for example, the ministry of, um, I'm just picking an industry. This is a, a, it's not reality, but I'll just pick the Ministry of Mines and Industry have a, has an event. Uh, they ask, you know, a school in that area, in Kabul mostly, to send a group of kids to come and sing a national song or a, a patriotic song. And that school would send that, you know, after getting permission from the authorities, they would gather up a group of kids to go and sing a song or sing a, a, a national anthem at that event. And what I noticed in my time is that that group of singers or these group of you know, kids going were always girls, never boys, always girls. And teenage girls between the ages of 15 to 17, you know, those upper grades, so 10th to 12th grade, young girls. And, and I also noticed that they were not going in their school uniforms. We have in Afghanistan a mandate for children to wear a school uniform. I never saw in these events where this group of kids going to sing ever worn uniforms. There were young women dressed, you know, hair made up, makeup, um, beautiful attire, and they would go to these events where the majority of the audience in these events were men. And this is a reality, this is a fact. I'm not making this up. People can go and, and, and take records. And these are men. And remember, you know, here I am talking as a feminist, as a woman in a society where it is patriarchal, where sexual abuse unfortunately was and is still present, not just in Afghanistan, this is a phenomenon all over the world. And it's in a society that was not yet, in my opinion, again, not emotionally developed to handle such a, 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 such a scenario or a presentation. And with the social media and access to um, uh, iPhones, you know, smartphones everywhere, I started noticing because I was always sitting at the front, you know, as minister, you start, you shift your place. You're no longer part of the audience. You are the stage holder. And I noticed in some events where my young girls, daughters, girls started singing and performing, all the audience or majority of the audience would take out their phones, you know, they, and they start recording either via phone, you know, photos, videos, or whatnot. And you know, you have you have no control over people's personal media that they use. And I started thinking, where am I living and where am I working? And I started imagining if my own daughter Zara is 16, 17 years of age, you know, that young budding age in a culture in a society where she can easily become prey to predators. I would not want her to be, to be in that environment, to potentially have her picture, her video be abused by men that I, I don't know and that men I don't have control over. So I dared as minister of education, as a female, as a mother, I said, I asked the question, I said, why are we always sending only girls of a particular age group to these events dressed up to perform for men. Why don't we ever have boys? Why don't we ever have younger kids? Why is it always that one particular group age of girls, young teenage girls? The question to that response was never given to me appropriately as to why that group. And so naturally as someone who has studied, you know, women's issues, that age group that young age group, you know, dressed up as beautiful dolls is a wonderful marketing tool. And I did not want my ministry, me as a responsible entity for that ministry to 
allow my girls to be sexually abused by the society in that format. It was a conversation. It was a discussion point. It was a question that I asked. I never made a mandate to say girls cannot sing. Unfortunately, a man, <coughs> not even within my management team, received this question through other people and went ahead and signed and a decree in his own authority. And he doesn't even have that authority. I mean, this is the other thing. In the past 20 years, we had hired and brought on people to lead institutions that they were not fully capacitated to do so. He signs a decree by his own authority, which was not his authority to do so, sends it out to Kabul city, that girls over the age of 12 are banned from singing. I was completely unaware of this when he did that. He did not consult us. He did not consult the ministry. He, he gave himself the authority to be able to go do this because he probably thought that that was the way to handle it. That was not my way of handling it. I questioned a behavior that I did not like, and I wanted my management team to start thinking and questioning and analyzing why we were doing this thing that made me uncomfortable. But it did not mean that I'm against women's singing or music. For all that I know, I'm a, I love music. I love culture. I love a society to thrive on these important you know, pillars of any society to promote culture and, and expression and free thought and elements of different um, uh, studies. We don't have to teach our children all to become doctors and engineers. We need a, a diversity of the portfolio. But unfortunately, before I could even reach to something, the media picked it up picked up this, this, this not very smart man's um, uh, judgment on an issue that was very personal and dear and near to me. And of course, in a society where everybody loves to blame, particularly a woman sitting in a position, it was the perfect opportunity for social media, for media folks, even internationally, Telegraph even picked it up without, without uh, doing the due diligence of contacting my office to make sure, is this something you've said? So I want this to become a story and I encourage journalists to please use the story to learn and relearn what you've taught because yes, it's wonderful and it's beautiful to sell stories. And that was a wonderful story that it got sold so beautifully at a perfect time you know, the, it, it, it rose the perfect emotions across the world. You know, even internally in my country, women started singing in cars and in households and started putting videos up because they wanted to sing. Without even listening, did this minister ever say not to sing? Did this minister ever say that it's not appropriate for girls to sing? My question was not that. My issue was with my girls being displaced to be potentially sexually abused by the eyes of horrible men that I did not see comfortable, you know, I did not feel comfortable comfort with. And I don't think there's any sane mind in the world who would disagree with my assessment that I made as a woman, as a mother, as a minister responsible for the well-being of my children. And unfortunately, like this, there are many other stories. And I'm not trying to paint that all ministers or all politicians are good people and all the intentions. I'm not speaking for anybody. I'm speaking for my own self and I'm actually still proud and I will still continue to work hard to protect, to protect the honor and dig dignity of my daughters at that age because they are bound to be preyed upon ugly people all over the world who we now know through, through cybersecurity. Pictures, videos, coming into the hands of wrong people do cause a lot of damage. And in a society where my girls, you know, I, I do live, I am from a country that is very conservative, that is very traditional. And one small little tiny taint on a girl's image 
can ruin her entire future. And as a responsible adult, is it not my responsibility to look after that? So I, I rest my case and you guys then decide. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your views on it because that's the main purpose of my initiative. Mm, rather than doing interrogations, I would like to ask even controversial questions so that we can hear the views from the other side. And in the end, the viewers will draw their own conclusions. Now, as we are running late before going to the next segment on the present day situation of Afghanistan and the Taliban rule, let me ask you a quick question. Mm, if somebody declares himself or herself as an atheist and also a homosexual, can they survive in Afghan society? I am asking you because you have studied both religious and, and gender studies. So it, I would really like to hear your honest opinion on it. This is a question where I honestly uh, don't feel that I have the right information or uh, I'm not the right person to ask this question. I know my society, I know my people, um, I know how the Afghan psyche and, and mindset works. Um, there's a lot of, uh, what is that term? I'm blanking out on English right now. There's a lot of progress, quote unquote, that you know certain parts of the world have made in terms of rights and uh, regulations and acceptance and, and open-mindedness. Open um, all over the world. And still in 2022, there are pockets of the world where that level of progress has not been made for obvious reasons. Cultural, societal, traditional, conservatism, uh, economics, um, education, all of these are elements that still play a huge part in, in the mindset of a society. And while I'm not denying that I'm, I'm not rejecting that the issue of sexuality is a reality, is a phenomena, not just now, but you know, historically um, has always been, and it was always undercover. And now more and more societies are opening up to accepting and, and making opportunities uh, open uh, to various different people of different, uh, you know, makeup or, or you know how they they uh, express their sexuality um afghanistan as a nation and as a people uh, still remain a very conservative and a very traditional society uh, i'm not necessarily endorsing that um our way is better or worse than other ways it's just the reality of where we are as a, as a as a country and as a people and um, Unfortunately, today, you know, you take a country like Canada, for example, and you compare it to a country like Afghanistan for the, um, you know, homosexual or transsexual community. Yes, Afghanistan, and I'm going to be quite blunt, it's not the safest or the most open environment uh, in the world, as say, a country like Canada, for example. Um, but that does not that does not mean that uh, there's no sympathy or that there's no understanding for people of that community. It will just take its own time, its own um, um, you know history to be made. Uh, but we cannot neglect the fact that Afghanistan remains a very traditional, conservative, religiously bound society that that does look at things within that lens. Um, some people are gonna like it, some people are not. And that's just how it is. I don't see, um, and I'm being quite honest and blunt, blunt and, and realistic, I don't foresee the uh, movement um, of the L, I'm sorry, I don't know the full <laughs> acronyms, but I, I don't see the movement of the uh, homosexual or transsexual society being a priority uh, 
in the government now or any um, in the and, and you know the foreseeable future now let's move to the next segment of this interview that's from august 15 2021 to the present day can you tell us what happened on august 15 in detail i mean please walk us through the situation in kabul on that day starting from the morning and how everything had changed so quickly um for me it was just another day um i went woke up and went to my work just like i would any other day i in fact i had two meetings uh where the people who were to meet with me did come on time and we had our meetings um and i went about my business as usual um in fact um a, a rumor came around 10 you know 10 30 ish in the morning where there was chaos on the streets around us were in the building in the building our staff was uh, confused and running around and i actually uh, went out myself um, because my secretary told me that there's rumor that the government has collapsed and everybody's so confused and running i went out uh, reassured people that um, you know, I'm still here. I'm part of the government. The government has not collapsed. Um, and it was interesting going and meeting people because uh, there were only men. Uh, I only saw men at, at that time when I went out. Um, an old man came um, after I assured them that I was there and he said, and he called me a child. And that's, that's you know, in, a, in our culture and society, you know, me in my mid forties uh, to be called a child from an older gentleman. It's, it's completely normal. And it was actually very sweet. He said, I'm so proud of you, my child, uh, for sticking with us, for being with us. And it gives us the courage to remain. And so I went back to my office, started working on, um, like I said, we were uh, finalizing the national education policy uh, draft um, to be sent to the president for final approval. Um, and so I was talking to my deputy minister, as well as uh, two or three other colleagues in the room to kind of finalize those. Um, typing was done, but we just had to tweak a little bit of the language here and there. And around 12.15, my chief of staff came and said, there's not a single other person left in the ministry, uh, including the security staff. Um, we have to leave. And I said, I'll only leave if everybody else who's remaining in my office. So my chief of staff, my secretary, and some other folks who were working with us, I said, I'll only leave if you all leave. Um, so we all gathered our things up and left. Uh, and it was true. Uh, when we left, when we went out, we were leaving the main gate of the ministry. Uh, not a single police had remained. Um, the doors were wide open and um, and we just left. We left in our cars. Uh, of course, the traffic on the streets were, um, the traffic was more than obviously normal. People were running around, you know, shops were being closed. It was a, it was a surreal um, uh, image in a sense that it has uh, stayed with me and will always stay with me. Um, and I just, I was in disbelief. I couldn't believe what had happened. Uh, and officially we hadn't received anything. So I still was doubting what was happening, um, information, obviously. And now in retrospect, as the president has given his speech and the uh, national security advisor, now I know why, because they were obviously um, engaged in other decisions that didn't allow them to communicate with the remaining of the cabinet members to uh, inform what was happening. And so I went home and late afternoon that day, uh, it was confirmed that uh, the government had collapsed and that uh, we had handed over or the, not handed over, but the Taliban basically were asked to come and take uh, control. Um, and quite honestly, that first evening, the fear was great within myself, with my family, with people that we knew. Uh, the fear was that, um, you know, criminals, uh, thugs, criminals who had guns and weapons in, in their, you know, possession um, over the past 20 years, uh, that they could really take advantage of this opportunity, of this vacuum. Uh, and so the Taliban coming and taking control over the city overnight was partly due to stopping 
those criminals from uh, going to people's homes and causing chaos. And so that night passed. I don't know how it passed, but it did. Um, and then I was contemplating whether I wanted to leave the country or not. Um, and after about six or seven days of thinking and contemplating and um, seeing the reality of what was happening in Kabul airport, you know, the guys who uh, clung to uh, airplanes and falling out. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, a, it's a story that is obviously not going to be remembered as a good story uh, in history. And, uh, and, and the way this whole thing fell and it happened, it's, it was very devastating. Um, and finally, ultimately, it was my daughter uh, who made me make the decision that I, I cannot risk her future. Uh, it's one thing for me as you know, 45, 44, 45 year old to sit, uh, you know, I've, I've lived a good chunk of my life. Um, taking a risk for me personally, uh, or my husband taking a risk for him personally, or for either one of us as adults, it's one thing. But to unnecessarily expose a child uh, that can have and that should have a different future. And it's unfortunate. Uh, like I said, in the beginning, I said, I do see, I saw and I do see the children of Afghanistan as my own. And it gives me incredible pain to know that at the end of the day, I selfishly took my own daughter because she is mine and you know she is part of my, my, my identity and who I am. Um, and I was able to take her out and I did. So there is that certain level of guilt that continues to remain with me. Um, but at the same time, the other side of the argument is any other parent in that situation um, would probably do what I did. Um, and so finally, when I decided that I cannot have Zara take this risk with me, I decided to leave. We decided to leave and uh, yeah, it was, uh, we were evacuated just like everybody else uh, through the military planes, um, long hours of sitting in the heat in Doha, uh, ultimately eventually coming back to the US and uh, starting life all over again, knowing yeah. that we've lost 20 years of investment, my adult life, my, you know, more, my working life has predominantly been in Afghanistan and to just lose it. Um, there's a lot of emotions of anger, frustration, um, um, guilt, um, all of, all of the emotions that you can imagine a human being going through. Uh, and it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, and part of me still says, can I be of help if I go back home? Uh, so I have not given up on the idea of returning. Um, and I know uh, psychologically and you know emotionally, I know that if at any time in history of Afghanistan, now is the time where we're needed even more. But to protect you know, yourself, to protect your family and to, to, to um, take a pause uh, for the benefit of your own, even as selfish as it might sound and seem, um, I think we, we human beings also have that right. And, and as hard as it is, sometimes we're forced to make those decisions. And that's the decision that I'm in right now. And it's not easy uh, living through this, but I'm taking one day at a time and hoping that things can still change. And I can only hope for the better uh, for the future. So you have mentioned several times your daughter's name, Zara, and I can understand as a mother how much you were worried about her future. But did you think about your father on that day? Because there are similarities between your story and your father's story. Your father, Gulam Haider Hamidi, was an accountant by profession and became the mayor of Kandahar. He was assassinated by a 17-year-old Taliban suicide bomber in 2011. 
Many say that Pakistan's ISI was also involved in his assassination. Today, you are in a position like your father was in a few years ago, and you are thinking about Zara's future in the same Taliban rule. Were you overwhelmed too much on that day? How did you manage your psychological pressure? You know, my father has always been will, and will always be uh, a part of my mission and vision in life. Uh, he was my best friend. He was my inspiration. You know, many people um, recently when um, Imran Khan made that statement of it is in the Pashtun tradition to not teach, you know, young girls or, or women. Uh, I took that criticism very personally because my father was a proud Pashtun man. I'm a proud Pashtun woman. My husband is a Pashtun man, although he has Tajik blood in him. Um, I'm not ashamed of calling myself a Pashtun and I do not endorse the Taliban to be a representation of the Pashtun tribe. They happen to be Pashtun by tribe, but they're driven by an ideology that can be adapted by any ethnicity, any group, any people in the world. You don't have to be a Pashtun to become a Talib and vice versa. Um, so for Imran Khan to get on an international stage and um, criticize a, an ethnicity, um, to be a certain way when all my life, all of my family's lineage life, my grandfather moved from village in Kandahar to the city to enable his daughters to go to school. And he was an illiterate man himself. He was a Pashtun uh, farmer. My father has um, five daughters and he did everything and anything to promote and to encourage and to enable the opportunity in it. The reason he immigrated all the way to America, so far away from his home, was not to restart his own life. He didn't have a mission other than enabling his children to have a different future. And his children happened to be girls. And he came here to give a different opportunity to girls, to his girls. And when I decided to go back to Afghanistan in 2003, um, everybody, including my mother was against it. But the only person who encouraged me and pushed me was my father. As a Pashtun man, he knew his daughter was not married. He knew his daughter was a young woman, but he had his faith and trust in his daughter to be able to do something for her country. And I still remember him saying that he was proud of his daughter because my decision to come to Afghanistan um, encouraged him to return back. Unfortunately, he joined the government at that time. And unfortunately, he created enough enemies within the structure to be able to commission out a suicide bomber to come and kill him. Now, you know, the media to this day says that the Taliban killed my father. I don't believe that. Um, I'm not a Talib sympathizer. I'm not um, giving any um, credit to the Taliban, but I know my father was not killed by the Taliban. My father was killed by warlords, drug lords, uh, land grabbers that were uh, heavily involved in the Karzai administration at the time. And what my father was trying to do was to stop that corruption. He banned people from building uh, high rises on government property. He banned people from building structures without paying appropriate taxes. As mayor of, of a city, that's the job of mayor of a city. That's what he does. He stopped people, you know, these criminals who um, were, you know, 
politicians at the time uh, within various sectors of government fields, he would not give permission to build a 10 story building without building, you know, without putting a single um, a latrine or bathroom in the building or not having a parking lot uh, designed or, de you know, designated to that building. This is what my father did. This is what created the, the animosity and the criminals, some of whom are still alive today, they saw him as a threat. And they didn't have the guts or the courage to go and um, shoot him or kill him themselves. Because of course, at the end of the day, they had to play the game of saying, we're the good guys. But we all know that it was easily, um, it, was, it was possible to commission out suicide bombers. I mean, it had become a business. Suicide bombers were commissioned to go and carry out things for other people. And then of course the Taliban um, always took credit for things that happened left and right, uh, because why wouldn't you? You know, everybody likes free credit. And so um, it's, it's a very tough situation to be in. Um, again, I'm not saying this just to give um, credibility to the Taliban or side with the Taliban. No, I, I said this, I made this statement the day he was killed, I'm still sticking to that statement uh, now, almost 11 years later. Um, and this is the belief that my whole family believes um, because this, this, is, this is something we feel is the truth. Um, and the world can think otherwise, but really I'm not living for the world. I'm living for my loved ones and my family and losing our best friend, our leader, our father. Um, the loss and the pain is ours and the world can sympathize with us. But at the end of the day, I'm not letting the world narrate uh, who the killers of my father are. Yes, it is a very tragic story and I have my deepest sympathy for you. As poet Rumi, who was born in your country, once said that out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, I will meet you there. When the soul lies down in the grass, the world is too full to talk about. So keeping aside the politics, religion, religious dogma, in the end, we all are human and we have our own family who we, uh, whom we do care a lot. So thank you very much for sharing your father's story and I am really sorry for your loss and damage. Now I would like to talk about the peace deal between the US government and the Taliban. I'll particularly talk about two important figures and their link with the fall of Kabul. The first person is Ambassador Zalme Khalilzad, an Afghan by birth and later he immigrated to the United States and become an American diplomat. He was the chief of negotiating team from the American side. And the other person is Dr. Hamdullah Mohib, who was the national security advisor of Afghanistan. Now the reporters claim he advised the ex-president Ashraf Ghani to leave the country within a few minutes. Sources claim Ambassador Khalilzad and Dr. Mohib did not share a good relationship and Dr. Mohib publicly criticized Ambassador Khalilza. It is often overlooked, this, their relationship. And do you think that they could have played a better role in the negotiations? Well, I mean, Hamdullah Mohib and Khalilzad have both given their interviews. Um, I have uh, met with and uh, seen Hamdullah Mohib uh, closer, obviously being and sh you know sharing the same cabinet that we did. Um, so of course I'm I might be biased because I got to know him more than Khalilzad, um, but I, I'm not friends with him, so I'm not speaking from a friend's perspective. Um, I'm just talking from the perspective of 
what I witnessed and how I saw things developing on the ground in Kabul. Um, first of all, Khalilzad and Hamdullah Mohib don't have uh, animosity, at least that I know of. The, I mean, there are different generations and they're different people. Um, Khalilzad's problem with Afghanistan was more with President Ashraf Ghani. Uh, they were classmates. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, you know, issues, and 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 you could sense that. And unfortunately, the jealousy factor of of people, um, you know, I I I think from the conversations in Afghanistan, um, you know, there was the jealousy factor between. Khalil Zad and Dr. Ashraf Ghani because Dr. Ashraf Ghani became a um, leader uh, in a country where you know people liked him and people still like him, people still love him, people still uh, respect him. We're not going to have another President Ashraf Ghani anytime soon. Uh, you know, we we looking at our history. There are very, uh, you know, there's a handful of leaders in Afghanistan's history that has the vision and the mission and the knowledge uh, that a person like Ashraf Ghani did. And it's, it's, there's no doubt of his incredible uh, knowledge, incredible uh, passion, incredible love for the country and developing this country. Uh, uh, I often, uh, you know, look at myself, and I'm not comparing myself to President Ashraf Ghani by any means, but I think we do share something in common, which is, I think him and I both were, we were more interested in developing and progressing and changing the things that we saw more so than being interested in playing the dirty games of politics. Um, he, you know, I saw President Ghani working 16 to 18 hours daily. I mean, I wasn't with him in his office, but you could see it. I'll, you know, say one incident. We took a trip to Kandahar province, my, my birth town. Uh, we all left the Kabul city at 6 a, 6.15 a.m. And it's an hour flight. Landed in Kandahar about 7.15 a.m. He went straight uh, this is President Ashraf Ghani. He went straight from getting down from the plane to a, a set of meetings after meetings after meetings. We left Kandahar City at 12.50 a.m. the next morning. This president, other than a small lunch, a 30-minute lunch break, which of course was not a lunch break because he, I'm sure he was sitting with people eating lunch too, he came back to the plane at 12.50 a.m. All of us, you know, young ones, exhausted, tired. He picked up his papers and he kept, he turned his reading light um, on and he read until we got back to Kabul. This is a man who knew the value of every single minute that he was president. Um, so your question was more about Mohib, but I think it's more about the president. Dr. Mohib, you know, was responsible uh, for the position that he was, which was to, you know, be advisor of the national security of Afghanistan to the president. And as he rightfully has said in his interview, he was not solely responsible for the security sector. Remember that there were three other major institutions, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Interior, and um, I don't know the English name of the other, the NDS, which is the uh, National Directorate of Security, National I believe. Defense. Huh? National Defense? It, it, no, it, it's an it's a institute. It's a basically the Secret Service type of... Oh, okay. uh, like I mean, RAW I, I, and I, CIA, like something like yeah, that? Yeah, so it's, it's, I think it was called the NDS. Um, and these three institutions, uh, along with the office of Hamdullah Mohib, um, were all responsible for the security sector uh, of the nation. And one thing that, um, it doesn't surprise me, but that angers me, is how the world is so quick to jump to finding a scapegoat 
and then just putting everything and anything on that one person, one position. In, in his interview, Hamdullah Mohib, you know, Dr. Mohib clearly says that we're all responsible for the fall. And I think that's an incredible, uh, uh, honorable thing to, to, to listen to. Somebody to say, yes, we were responsible for this, but I'm not the only one who is responsible for it. Everybody is, and we need to take a collective responsibility for this. You know, something that um, I, you know, as someone who's been living and working in Afghanistan for, you know, 20 years, I lost my father. I was in Kandahar. I saw and witnessed things that many people didn't. The situation under President Karzai's time from 2001 until 2014, I believe, is when President Ashraf Ghani took um, charge. They were not any good either. A lot of the foundational problems in the country that led to the collapse were set in the early 2000s. And Ashraf Ghani was not responsible for the country at that time. Hamdullah Mohib was not the security advisor at that time. You know, again, I urge people to, as they start and as they are so quick to jump to conclusions and, and, and play the blame game, just like in the story of my, you know, girls and singing, I urge people to, 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 to do your due diligence of going into a little bit of a deeper understanding of why things happened the way they did. When America went to Afghanistan in 2001, the, the, most, the, the biggest mistake and the most critical mistake that America and its allies, NATO, made in 2001 was to align itself with warlords and drug lords that had been in charge of destroying Afghanistan even prior to the Taliban coming and reinstating them in the new government by giving them new monies, new power, new you know, fame and name, and continuously supporting them for 20 years. You know, people blame the president and Hamdullah Mohib for saying you had 360,000, um, you know, what do you call it? The police, uh, not the police, the army folks, right? Well, somebody else was in charge of that institution for many, many years. The pre it is not the president's job and responsibility to go and track every single soldier in the country. There were institutions in place that were supported, funded, and managed by other individuals. Yes, the president was overseeing it, but the president can only make decisions based on information that he receives. I saw that in the cabinet. One of the reasons that I saw the president's uh, behavior towards the Ministry of Education changing uh, after my arrival is because I did the unthinkable too. I was very frank and honest. I did not lie. I did not tell the president, oh, the ministry is perfect. It's beautiful. We have everything running perfectly. And unfortunately, many politicians, not just in the Ministry of Education, but across the ministries in Afghanistan, they consistently gave information that was not correct. But the president has no time to go and check every single accuracy to make sure that what I'm being given, you know, he put his faith and trust in people as his cabinet members and hoping that they would be honest with him. And so same thing with Hamdullah Muhib. It was not his job to go village to village, you know, from post to post to make sure that the security sector was operating as it should. There are Everybody is responsible, including the international community in the fall of Afghanistan. And so at the end of the day, I'm not going to blame Mohib. I'm not going to blame Khalilzad. If anybody, if anybody, the reason I am angry and um, I want to put more blame on Khalilzad is because he also lied, like other politicians. He lied to the American public or to the American government that the Taliban had changed. He, he painted a, a, an image of the Taliban 
to America that these are not the same folks of the 1990s. He also, uh, and now the president, um, you know, our uh, President Ashraf Ghani uh, claimed in his interview too that there were two different contracts that were signed. And some, you know, the world needs to start pulling that out. You signed one deal with the Taliban and another deal with, to show the Afghan government that it, that it, it isn't what it was supposed to be. So there were lies, there were misinformation, there was painting of not accurate information to the public here and to the, the government here that led to decisions that led to the fall of Afghanistan. So, you know, one thing that I, I, I want to say is that politicians at the end of the day are human beings too. Politicians don't have supernatural powers. We are prone to, you know, when we when we do sit in positions and the incredibly difficult task of doing a job as a security national security advisor of Afghanistan in a time that was so incredibly difficult. At the end of the day, let's be fair and see, you know, Dr. Hamdullah Mohib as a human being as well that needed rest, that needed support, that needed you know, time to process all the incredible, um, horrible things that were happening across the country day in and day out. And then to have people like Khalil Zad staying and living in America, his personal interest in Afghanistan was zero. His, his wife is American, his children are American. They, are, they, they have no plans of returning back to Afghanistan. He's not educating his kids in Afghanistan. He's not worried about his grandkids growing up and living there. And so, of course, you look at that scenario and compare it to people like Hamdullah Mohib, who was there, whose children were there, whose children were going to school there, taking the incredible risk every single day as they you know, went from home to school and school to home. It's not. You know, people need to start seeing more to, to people and to icons and to names uh, to understand the situation uh, more. Uh, I'm not, um, again, I hope my, my intention in this is not to say that Mohib is not to be blamed or, you know, Khalil Zad is totally to be blamed. I'm not trying to make, take sides, but I think we need to be fair in our judgment of how we see people in the decisions that they make. Uh, I have, and I probably would not be able to say what I'm saying now had I not served myself in a position of influence. I can only speak from my experience and I can only use that experience to better understand that it's one thing to sit and judge from afar, from out of context, from you know, retrospect. But it's another thing to be going through that incredibly tense times and issues and consistently uh, uh, getting reports that people are being killed left and right. And you're in that position to be able to make a decision to address it and knowing that you're not fully in control because you have so many more elements around you affecting you. It is not an easy task. And I understand now that uh, Mohib had one of the most incredibly hardest jobs in Afghanistan. And I think he did the best he could humanly possible. Do you think the Taliban has changed and become more progressive? I mean, let me give you one example. The spokesperson of foreign ministry, Mr. Abdul Kahar Balki, attracted media attention for his fluent English and calm interview. If you read comments on YouTube, many actually post positive things about him. In the first press conference with Shabihullah Mujahid, he said that women will be allowed to study and work within the right of Islam. I'm emphasizing the phrase again, right of Islam. According to you, what is the interpretation of the right of Islam? Do you think they will really allow women to work and study? Because it is also their fundamental right that a 
country should let them exercise um, i mean this is a, this is a big huge uh, subject the taliban have changed or not changed i'm not an expert of the taliban movement neither am i uh, no, neither do i have information um, to their leadership or to their uh, vision and mission of what they um, hope to do uh, to understand whether their mission and vision has changed from you know the mid 90s to to now but I can only judge from what I see and what I hear um, from their practice, uh, particularly as it relates to women's, women's agency. The fact that they have, um, and I'll, I'll be clear, they have not officially banned girls from going to school beyond seventh grade. They're saying they're, they put a hold on it until further notice. But then again, going back to the 90s, that hold lasted more than five years. So looking at the past experience, I can only speculate that if this hold is in place now, this hold might also last more than what they're suggesting for girls' education. You know, their, their uh, assessment of, well, girls' education needs to be Sharia-oriented in separate classes. As Minister of Education, who witnessed and who saw, my girls' high schools were all separated anyway. There were never girls and boys sitting together in classrooms or even in the same school ever beyond seventh grade. The only areas where there were some areas that had mixed classrooms were under under age uh, under grade six in areas where there were just simply not enough schools, and so you were forced to by the nature of the society and not having enough schools, uh, physical schools available, we were forced to put girls and guys together in classrooms, usually under grade three. I mean, it, 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 uh, most of the classes were never even together up until grade six, so only about three or four. So that's their other interpretation where I'm questioning, what, what else do you need Sharia? I mean, how else do you define Sharia? And their, their understanding or their interpretation of Sharia they keep using the title Sharia, but as a Muslim, I'm not a scholar by any means and I, I never would claim that, but I do know enough to know that when you say Sharia, you need to define it. What their definition of Sharia is, is a question to me, to millions of others, to Islamic scholars, to everybody around the world as to what is that definition that they're trying to give to Sharia in the various different uh, contexts of, of subjects that they're trying to address. But at the same time, you know, as a human being who had uh, the opportunity to go meet with the Taliban, I did go once they invited me. I did not let fear overcome me as a woman to go meet with them, to go sit with them, to go talk with them. And in fact, that's what the whole past three years or three, more than three years investment of the international community on this talks in Doha was about, right? To go sit and talk with the Taliban. And that's, that's what you do. You talk out problems and issues in the hopes of coming to a conclusion. Um, and I think if, if the US had um, managed this better, um, we probably would have a different Afghanistan today. Uh, but unfortunately, America, uh, Washington, and its representative Khalilzad really mismanaged uh, these, these talks um, by excluding the government of Afghanistan from day one. Um, and so I believe in sitting and talking to people who even have completely uh, different or, or completely different ideas and ideologies about not only Islam, not only Afghanistan, not only you know human beings, but people differ. You and I differ in our thinking on certain issues, but that doesn't mean we go and kill each other and we um, diminish each other. And that's that that's in my opinion that's the premise of democracy: to be able to live in a society, but not necessarily think the same. And Islamically speaking, if you look at the fourteen hundred years of history of Islam in various parts of the world, um, there have always been pluralism in Islamic societies. Not everybody's always of one thought and one ideology and one way of thinking. 
And yet Muslim societies have enabled and, and thrived in those communities. And you look at India, for example, um, for hundreds of years, the Muslim community and the Hindu community and the Christian community, and maybe there are other faiths too, and I'm just picking the top three, um, they've peacefully lived with each other without any problems. Of course, now, and, and historically, there's been moments of, of conflict, obviously, and it's rising again. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think this is an Islamic movement per se. Unfortunately, again, having served as in the education um, sector or having worked in the education sector, um, education is an incredible tool um, to use and abuse. Um, and knowing the limitations of this particular group where, you know, the, 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 their exposure of education is probably not um, similar to someone who can anal analytically analyze situations critically or, or otherwise. And, and you use um, a very personal and a very uh, important element of belief uh, Islam and politicians or, you know, people in the region who know that that's an, an you know, an incredibly important value, um, you use it and abuse it to, to maintain your power. And so then you start having young people who go and who are even willing to blow themselves up in the belief that they believe, you know, the, the young man who killed my father uh, from his taskira in his pocket, um, it showed that he was a 67, 16 year old kid from Uruzgan originally. You know, to this day, people ask me, what do you think of him? And I said, I don't, I, I don't even think about him. I feel sorry for him because he was used. He was used by the perpetrators who use such young minds and play with their emotions to encourage them to do something that they think is right. A 16 year old boy's mind from a developmental point of view, it's that age of a mind where there's incredibly, you know, chaotic movements happening in the brain. You can shift it and use it in any shape or form. Have you ever heard of a suicide bomber who's 50 years old? or who's 60 years old, right? I mean, there's, there's a strategy why they prey upon young boys of that age where there's a, a lot of things happening in the brain. And so I don't blame the young kid who blew himself up. I blame the people who set the scenario and the grounds for these young people to go blame themselves up. So in a, in a way, again, I'm not legitimizing or trying to side with the Taliban, but you know, this young man who comes to serve speaking uh, great English, I, I don't know his background. I don't know whose son he is. I don't know his lineage. Um, I don't know if his, his father or his grandfather was from him. New Zealand. He, he was oh, he's New from Zealand. New Zealand. But what is his family background? Were his parents Talibs? I don't know. I mean, was his father a Talib? Was his grandfather a Talib? I, you know, for me, as an Afghan, that's important because we, we don't live in the void of an individual identity. We carry and we identify ourselves through our lineage, who we are carrying that with us for, for, for centuries. So I don't know who he is, okay? But as a speaker to the Western world, he speaks perfect English, he wears a turban, he has a beard, he's young, he, you know, perfect icon for, for media. But what he's saying, I wonder, you know, he's probably in his mid twenties at most. I, I don't think he's even reached 30 yet. I don't know if he's really set on what he wants to do in life, but even if he is, he's again, a young person who has been recruited to believe what he's taught to believe. Um, my whole point in saying all these things is to go after the roots. Who's supporting these, this ideology? who invented this ideology, who's financing this ideology, I think that's a much more, uh, that, that's a much more meaningful conversation to have 
rather than these lay people who are trying to carry out missions in the name of this and that. And at the end, really, does it matter? Um, we were trying to promote democracy for 20 years, right? And then all of a sudden it just shattered. So now they're trying to promote their version of a Sharia emirate uh, or emirate that Islamic emirate that promotes Sharia. How long they will last? I don't know that because ultimately the question goes back to who, who's supporting it, who's financing it, and how sustainable is it? Now I want to talk about ex-president Ashraf Ghani because there are two images of him in front of international media. One is a renowned economist, politician, good orator, and a writer who has written a book about fixing the failed state. And on the other hand, that he's an arrogant person, he doesn't respect common people, he um, he, he, he betrayed the country fleeing from Afghanistan on August 15, and he did not care about others, basically the common citizen of Afghanistan when they actually needed him. Now, how do you compare these two images of ex-president Ashraf Ghani? I worked with him uh, very close and personally for 14 months. I did not know Dr. Ashraf Ghani before that. I knew of him, but I did not know him. Uh, and in these 14 months working with him, spending a lot of time in terms of when we were you know, going to these travels um, in country to various provinces, as well as um, I think one or two international trips we took together. I know this man to be incredibly smart, um, incredibly, I think I said these before, passionate about working, doing things. You know, that, 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 that notion of time is gold. Um, in America, every second matters. Um, he is ultimately a product of the Western society in a way too, because his latter part of, after he left Afghanistan when the communists came, he did spend it in, in US institutions mostly. And so he knows and understands the, the, the value, the incredible value of time. One thing I noticed with him and I saw very clear and personal was that uh, he was an incredibly efficient person. Um, he did not waste time on chats, on talks that wouldn't lead to a result. Um, his meetings were strictly um, you know, organized. Um, in fact, in the cabinet, um, I was not in the cabinet when President Karzai was uh, president, but I learned through my colleagues that um, since the arrival of President Ashraf Ghani, cabinet meetings were supposed to start at say nine o'clock. If you showed up at 9.02, you were not allowed. Cabinet meetings started at nine o'clock. So there was these wonderful things about him as a manager, as a leader to set standards and to push you know, people, leaders to, to follow. Um, he was incredibly in love with the history and identity of Afghanistan and what it has done you know, from, from the notion of civilizations that have passed through this country. And you know, some people criticize him to be just a Pashtun leader. The men knew about civilizations of the North, of the West, of the, you know, the Turkmen's and the, you know, the, 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 the Hazaras, um, things that happened to the Hazaras. He knew so much about women who had been incredibly instrumental in, in making history and making the, 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 the leaders of Afghanistan. Uh, because he he read he he read a lot and yes you know people say criticize him for reading but I don't know anywhere in the world where um, reading was ever a bad thing so you know I I'm just I'm just questioning people who criticize him for being in love with books and reading that's an incredibly uh, valuable skill to have 
And I think we should encourage more leaders to read because then hopefully they'll become smarter. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's some, some leaders in the world who really seriously do need to read uh, a bit more. Um, so personally, I have absolutely no question about his passion, about his will, about his uh, love uh, for developing. I, I sat in meetings where he talked about you know, the various um, uh, water, uh, what do you call it? Water dams, you know, the projects that um, he pushed to invest in. Um, he was incredibly, you know, just would just, just, you, you, you could just tell him his emotions when, you know, I would go and tell about um, the progress of certain things at the ministry um, because he was passionately in love with changing the education system. He was talking about the fourth industrial revolution that is, that is upon us as we speak um, to a country and to a people who didn't even understand what that was. So in a way, you know, it's, it's kind of like going back in history and reading about people who were ahead of their time. I, I kind of witnessed uh, Dr. Ashraf Ghani as president um, way ahead of his time in my country, uh, among my people, among the politics that was happening. The only thing that I do continue to say is that he was much more interested in development, in getting work done, in getting projects done, and in finding investment for long-term sustainable projects that would change the future of Afghanistan and change, you know, provide a different opportunity to the children of Afghanistan. He focused on that more than trying to please, you know, the 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 politicians of the past twenty plus years that were created and operating in Afghanistan. Um, I, I, I could tell the frustration that he had when he visited uh, the parliament, for example, because the parliament, the majority of the parliament comprised of those ugly politicians in 34 provinces uh, that were brought together and their one roof, uh, you know, in a building beautifully built by the Indian government. Um, I quickly learned also that I hated going to the parliament, not because I'm against the concept of parliament and the representatives of people, because that, that's part of a society, any society. But I wish one could actually go and assess the behavior, the, 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 the tone of talk, the tone of conversations, the type of topics and, and issues that the parliamentarians talked about. I mean, as someone who is incredibly intelligent and up to date with, 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 with world knowledge and world progress, to go and sit with people who are just so incredibly petty and 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 not thinking about future and and you know asking for personal benefits, which was the which was the plea of the parliamentarians. I mean, I I hope to one day write a book about the 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 requests that were made by the parliamentarians for me at the ministry in that short little period of time. It was never about doing anything better for the children of Afghanistan. It was always about hire my son-in-law, hire my brother, give contract to this person. And if that's what the majority of your representatives of your country are asking for, you naturally want to, you know, take yourself away from them because the frustration of dealing with that mindset on a daily basis, honestly, it, it prevents you from thinking. And so in that regard, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, uh, yes, could not connect with the majority of people in Afghanistan because they were just not understanding him. I, I don't mean to, um, I don't mean to belittle my, my colleagues and not all of them were in that category, but there were definitely elements within the cabinet, you know, there were members of the cabinet who I, I, I can say with conviction, who probably did not even understand Dr. Ashraf Ghani's comments or observations or assessments, uh, even at the cabinet meetings. 
because remember, not all of the politicians in Afghanistan were educated. Sure, certainly they have master's degrees and PhD degrees, and you can you can get a nice little paper with a stamp on it. And we all know that these institutions exist all over the world. But it's a different thing to, to, to have a mindset of someone, open-mindedness, willing to understand a variety of, of topics and conversations from an intellectual point of view. There were not too many intellectuals in Afghanistan. And I think that, yes, I, 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 in, in a proud way, I'm saying that Dr. Ashraf Ghani could not connect to to the ordinary people or forget ordinary people to the majority of people in Afghanistan, including his own cabinet members, because they did not have the intellectual capacity to understand him and to communicate with him. And it's a frustrating uh, position to be in, I can only imagine. Um, and because his interest was more in trying to see development, progress, projects, you know, just, just see more work, it's true, he didn't have time to just sit and talk to people and give them a meal and you know, gather people around to just talk nonsense about what. Afghanistan, the one thing that Afghanistan had, had, has, and will always have is free time for people to just sit and talk nonsense and call me critical for that. Uh, but unfortunately, because the majority of the population don't have much to do, they talk a lot. And their politicians loved that too. But Dr. Ashraf Ghani knew that his time was limited. There was a lot of work that needed to get done. And as a great manager and leader of someone who wanted to see more work done, he did not waste his time talking to people about nonsense. And in that regards, I respect him. I actually, I support him in that because Afghanistan had too much work to be done. I saw a lot of time wasted at my ministry and I was juggling too. Do I talk to these people because they wanna sit and talk with the minister of education or do I get work done? And in my little, you know, the ministry of education was a drop in the ocean of, of Afghanistan. And if I could sense that frustration, I can only begin to understand the incredible amount of frustration that President Ashraf Ghani was going through day in and day out because the majority of the political leaders just wanted to sit and talk and he had no time for that. My last question is how hopeful and optimistic you are about the future of Afghanistan. What message do you want to give to the children of Afghanistan those who don't understand the meaning of warfare and international politics, but probably they know that they are living in a dangerous situation. Like every child, probably they are dreaming to become an astronaut, a doctor, a teacher, or an activist like you. Being an Indian, I would love to visit Majare Sarif, Kabul, Kandahar, or we'll like to taste Kabuli Pulao or Chapun Kebab sitting in a restaurant in Kabul. Uh, we can probably have this conversation sitting in the backyard of your house with a cup of coffee. We, we drink tea, coffee. not coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll give you yeah. tea. We'll give you green tea. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> well, it's become a phenomena. Uh, in the past twenty years, the young Afghan men and women in Kabul and other major cities, you know, started building cafes where they were serving coffee because it's the thing to yeah. do it's that western connection to um to a trend that is cool uh, but you know traditionally speaking afghanistan is a tea drinking country and not a coffee drinking country um you know as long as we are alive um whether you're an Afghan or any other, um, you know, ethnicity or, or, or you know, from any other country in the world, um, my belief has always been that you cannot lose hope. You know, you live in, whether you have a small dream or a big dream, whether you, you know, are, you know, a sweeper in a little restaurant somewhere, to a minister or a president of a country, you as a human being, you can only live through hope. And looking at Afghanistan right now, it's an incredibly uh, 
sad, sad story of what happened, you know, 20 years of investment, both monetary as well as um, the human capital that went in, the, the human loss, the, the lives that we lost in Afghanistan in the past 20 years alone, by, by all sides, you know, I'm not talking about just the side of Afghanistan and the, the, the military and the civilians that got killed, but the international troops that gave their lives there, the people who came back with the hope and a wish, like my father, who were, you know, sacrificed for this nation. Um, so it's an incredibly sad story of the past 20 years, um, and then how it all ended in the way of, you know, ending uh, uh, kind of a, if I may use the simile of a love story, you know, the love story, it, it didn't finish in the way that you want to see in a movie where the two lovers live happily ever after. Unfortunately, the government of Afghanistan, this, this dream of a potential democracy that was implanted and hoped to flourish, um, the ending of the story is not a happily ever after story, at the moment at least. But as an Afghan, with an incredible long history of more than 5,000 years of history um, and an educator and a student of history. I, it's, I'm not allowing my emotions to say that, um, that, I've, that, 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 that the, the story of Afghanistan has ended. Um, 5,000 years of history gives us a lot of incredibly good things that may have happened and that have probably happened uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and there's a lot of incredibly bad and horrible things that have happened in Afghanistan. Um, we human beings have a short memory span, obviously for the time that we're living at it. Most, we live up to hundred years or a little bit more. No more than that. So our, our time is finite. And of course, we only see things and analyze and assess things in the time that we're in. And of course, things, you know, having lived through the experience of the collapse and the evacuation, obviously, it's much more near and dear to me than someone who will read it in books. Right. So that that that's a reality. But again, my hope, my belief in that nations and societies and empires and you know historically whatever name you give it they survive and the one whether you call it a beautiful thing it could be both be a curse and a uh, blessing is that the afghan people are a resilient people you know i sometimes sit and talk with my friends and colleagues about the incredibly horrible uh, things that have just come over and over again upon the Afghan population, Afghanistan's people in the past 45 years. You take, if you just take this scenario of what has happened to Afghanistan and to the Afghan people, and you just extrapolate it and implant it to other parts of the world and make another people go through similar uh, experiences. I'm, I'm interested in knowing how those, those communities and those people will survive it. Because at the end of the day, I am in communication with my friends, my family, my colleagues, my um, uh, you know, counterparts who are still living in the country. Remember about 120,000, add another 30,000 who are going, you know, who've probably left to the uh, surrounding uh, neighbors, make it even 200,000 people. 200,000 people have evacuated themselves in the past four months. Over 30 million people are still living in that country. They're still living. Yes, life has changed completely, drastically. Um, you know, many people are not doing the things that they were doing in the past 20 years. But I still have people on the phone talking and laughing and joking and planning, planning differently because they now know the situation has changed. And so they're smart enough to um, you know, see the change. They know that if they have the influence to affect the change, they will do so. Otherwise, they're adjusting themselves to fit in with the, with, with, with the nature of how things are happening right now. 
many of us have seen too much change in our lifetime where we've adjusted ourselves to be flexible enough to change with situations as it comes. And that's, that shows and that proves the resiliency of the people. Hopeful in the sense that one other beautiful thing that the Afghan nation has is that we are an incredibly powerful um, believing people. We believe in the power above humanity, I mean, the human beings, not humanity, but human beings. And, you know, I saw that incredibly uh, play strong uh, even after the COVID, uh, uh, you know, pandemic. We were a country that was struggling with the resources in our um, medical um, institutions, the medicine. We didn't have the appropriate doctors to address this virus. We did not have enough gas and, you know, the oxygen uh, in the gas balloons to be able to um, put those patients who needed oxygen. Um, but the, the thing that held the nation and, you know, I was there to witness it, people had their strong belief. They said, you know what? God will look after us. Allah will save us. And, you know, having that incredibly, and this is, you know, this brings me back to my religious uh, studies you know, communities that have strong faith also helps in their resilience. Uh, yes, they might, many people might not be happy with what the Taliban are doing, you know, as, as a government, as a regime, as, a, as an ideology. Um, but many people also believe that, you know, if they're patient and um, they ask for better things, they're hopeful that that prayer will be answered. Um, they'll have to go through this uh, test. Many people considered it a test. And this is um, where I too, uh, being in exile, being away from my home, being away from my community and my people. Um, I also, not only from a religious perspective, believe that things will change, but I also know from a practical perspective that you know, the last time this regime lasted about six years, five and a half to six years. Um, something happened and then there was that intervention and it had to change. But I also know that, you know, the past 20 years, yes, there were incredibly beautiful, great things that happened in Afghanistan. But at the same time, we cannot neglect and forget that horrible things were happening there too the amount of um, corruption among corrupt leaders, uh, the warlords, the drug lords, some of the politicians, um, you cannot you know, oversee that. The incredible amount of uh, violence that was taking, you know, that was happening on a day in and day out, whether it was that side or this side. I mean, at the end of the day, life was being lost. Families were being broken, you know, people had to constantly flee and seek protection and, and live in this incredible, I mean, I myself as minister of education, I was going in a bulletproof car, I hated it. I did not feel that I needed to be in a bulletproof car, but that was the mandate. And yet every single day leaving my house, I left with the sense that I might not return. So imagine working with that psychology, trying to be normal, knowing that you can be targeted any minute. That's not a normal state of, 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 of any society by any means. So yes, while we had wonderful things happening in the past 20 years, we also had an incredibly horrible situation of things that were happening uh, equally as bad. And so with the involvement of the international community and the politics of the region, the, the fight between India and Pakistan, the issues of Iran and Pakistan, and the issues of America and Iran, you know, then the stands, the Tajikistan's Russia and China, and you know, all of these countries involved in trying to control and affect and amend and 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 bring their own influence. Turkey, for example. Turkey is no saint in this situation either. Um, every single country and, and government or entity that was present in the past 20 years had, had brought with them their own issues. 
And we Afghans had to not only deal with our own issues, but then deal with all these other international issues that were taking place too on our grounds and among our people. And so you can imagine the stress that we were in. This, this regime of the, or this, this project of the past 20 years, if you may call it that, or if I may call it that, it was not sustainable. It was meant to collapse. It's unfortunate the way it collapsed, but it was meant to collapse. And I, I wish and, and I hope that we didn't have to hand it over to a group of people who themselves don't know how to make it any better. Um, but I'm, I'm, I believe in my people. I believe in my, uh, my, my sisters and my brothers. Um, and yes, we might go through a couple of years of distress, hopefully not a couple of years. I hope it's just a couple of months. Uh, we just don't know, but I believe in our resiliency and we will raise again and, uh, I'll continue to fight from where I can to help uh, in any capacity that I can. Um, my father is buried in the soil of Afghanistan. Uh, he sacrificed himself for this cause. Uh, I can only continue in his footsteps and I can only hope and pray that I won't have to sacrifice myself like millions of others who have. Um, but every society has those who believe and those who sacrifice and those who fight. Um, and we've had an incredible number of fighters uh, who have you know, lost their fight in this world, but they have left legacies behind. Um, and if my father has, is no longer to continue his fight, he has a daughter who has continued. He has a family uh, who will continue. And I think that's that's part of what humanity is, right? That's why we have children to be able to carry on the legacies, and that's why we build and invest in communities to be, carry on the legacies. And uh, you know, it's it's hard for outsiders to believe that that stamina or that that belief still exists among Afghans, but um, maybe it's in our blood. <laughs> <laughs> that we were fighters by nature and that's why nobody's able to conquer us ever and so as long as there's a, there's a beautiful song that my daughter was participating in in her school and and the song lyrics are I don't know who the writer of the lyrics is but it says until there is one Afghan there is Afghanistan so it, and there's still millions of us alive so <laughs> Hopefully we're young enough to know that um, there might come a time in the future where we might be able to speak again and to lead again and to do things again in different capacities to help uh, because that's the belief I believe in. We come into this world, not by accident, but for a purpose. And I think my the purpose, the way I understand my purpose is that I need to help make this world a little better than when I came to it. And when it's time to go, it's time to go. And I can't live in fear uh, of that time to go. Um, and as my father always beautifully used to say it, and he said it in a three-day interview before his um, assassination, he said, I would rather die in dignity fighting for what I know is right than die in a hospital from cancer or diabetes uh, not doing what I'm, you know, passionate about. And then that's exactly what he got. So with us Afghans, that's what we're doing. It's right now might be a hard time to go back and do something, but it doesn't mean that we ever give up on our land and our people and our future children. And I, and, 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 and if I'm able to continue to influence the education of our children to, to, to believe in this, um, in the values that I believe in, uh, then I think I've done my job. And that's what the job of a teacher really is, 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 is to instill values and inspiration in, in kids to carry the, the torch forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for agreeing to give me this interview again. And it was really nice talking to you. And at least I have learned a lot of things about Afghanistan at the ground level. And I hope that whoever will watch this video will have an idea from the other side. So yeah, 
And also good luck to your daughter, Zara. I hope that she will manage her time in America. Mm, it was really nice talking to you. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Bye-bye. Stay in touch. Bye-bye. Stay in touch. Yeah.